Hey guys, Texas Matt here. Thanks for joining us for the September newsletter. This month we are talking about protecting first responders in the event of hazmat incidents, a couple of insurance coverages you can benefit from like paper load coverage, more regulation to protect minors, and more. All right, let's get started. Well, another year has passed, as well as another annual international road check. The CVSA held the international road check back in May, and they just recently released the results. This year's road check is a 72-hour blitz and was focusing on anti-lock braking systems and cargo securement. Oh, I guess I should mention that you aren't just magically off the hook if your brakes work and your cargo is secure. Inspectors have no problem handing out any number of vehicle and driver violations, so make sure you are checking all the boxes on your pre- and post-trip inspections. In just a 72-hour period, they were able to inspect just under 60,000 CMVs and identify over 15,000 violations. Wow. Wow. What an accomplishment, right? No, 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 no. No. This is not an accomplishment for the CVSA. They want to get those numbers down, not up. It really makes you think about how many trucks and drivers are on the road that are not following the rules. Of those 115,000 violations, the U.S. accounted for under 20% of the violations. If you were one of the unlucky souls that fell victim to the CVSA hammer, or if you just have questions about a violation and want to challenge it, you can contact us at info at cnsprotects.com or just fill out the form below. As I mentioned, for vehicle violations, the focus was on ABS and cargo securement. Both are pretty important. If you can't stop your truck, you might have a little bit of a problem. And if your cargo is moving and shifting all over the place, you have just as big of a problem. Oh my God! See what I mean? There were just under 3,000 cargo securement violations and just over 4,000 ABS violations. And even though these two categories were the focus, there were still other more common violations that beat them out. The top five vehicle violations were brake systems, tires, defective service brakes, cargo securement, and lights. Tires and lights are some of the easiest things for inspectors to identify, and if those aren't good, they know they're bound to find more violations. On the driver side of things, the top out-of-service violations were hours of service violations, false logs, driving with a canceled or revoked license, and not having a medical card. It's no surprise about the hours of service violations, it's always the winner. But I was shocked that drivers are still trying to falsify their logs on that scale. If you recently received a DOT violation or went through a DOT audit and need to address your conditional or, or unsatisfactory safety rating, just fill out the form below or give CNS a call at 888-260-9448 and one of our DOT compliance specialists will help you out. Okay, today we're diving into some crucial updates to hazmat regulations and the required process of responding to hazmat incidents, much like the East Palestine chemical train derailment earlier this year. Since that derailment, regulators have placed a much higher focus on safety when it comes to the transport of these types of hazardous materials. We do know that the transport of these materials is necessary to keep our economy healthy and moving forward, so of course stopping transport is not an option at this point, but making it safer for the public and first responders is. By updating the accident response for trains, they have a goal of better protecting and informing first responders when they respond to an incident. Let's look at the current accident response for trains, the updates, and how they compare to the trucking industry requirements. Up to this point, the process when responding to accidents involving hazardous materials put the responsibility on the first responder, requiring them to access AskRail, an app allowing first responders to access cargo details and see what the train is hauling, and then correspond with crews to review the printed cargo information that they keep in the locomotive cab. Now, one thing that the railroads are required to do is maintain contacts of first responders along the route. The problem is that there's a lot happening and a lot of decisions being made by emergency response teams that then lead to mistakes. If you have questions or concerns, you can contact us at any time at info at cnsprotects.com or just fill out the form below. Okay, so let's discuss the rule and the proposed changes by the Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration that plans to shift responsibility to the railroad. 
The rule is proposing that railroads be required to immediately share cargo details with all emergency responders located within 10 miles of an incident as soon as they become aware of it. They plan to do this by sending push alerts with all of this information. This rule would apply to nearly 600 railroads and would eliminate the responsibility from first responders looking up all this information on an app. With that said, the app will still serve as a backup plan in case responders for any reason cannot access the information sent by the railroad authorities. Now, how does this differ from a hazmat incident in the trucking world? In trucking, the initial responsibility falls directly on the driver and the carrier. If a truck driver is involved in a hazmat incident, they're required to secure the scene and keep people away, limit the spreading of material when this is a safe option, communicate hazards to emergency responders, and provide shipping papers and emergency response info to emergency response teams. For the carrier, immediate notification is crucial if the hazardous material incident directly results in specific outcomes such as injury or fatality, public evacuation, closure of major transportation arteries, fire, breakage, or spillage of radioactive materials, infectious substances, medical waste, or marine pollutant incidents, and any situation warranting a judgment call of the driver. If you have questions or concerns, or want to take a look at the full requirements, you can check out the full article, or you can contact us at info at cnsprotects.com, or just fill out the form below. For infectious substances, the driver or carrier can notify the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and in cases of a reportable quantity of hazardous substances, the caller needs to provide all essential details. In addition, for hazardous materials, written emergency response information should match what is being transported and if carrier equipment includes an emergency response guide, no separate document is required. Carriers must also submit a detailed written report within 30 days of the incident unless they are exempt. With this increase in hazmat safety regulations, your first line of defense should be proper hazmat and DOT training. When it comes to hazmat, fines are weighted much heavier, so in addition to keeping others safe, staying compliant with state and federal regulations is extremely important. Non-compliance can lead to hefty fines and penalties, some exceeding $180,000. At CNS, we're fully equipped to provide top-notch hazmat compliance training and DOT training. If you need help, just fill out the form below. Have you ever heard of trailer interchange insurance coverage? Yeah, me neither. I just found out about it. Let me explain though. Have you ever gone to a neighbor and said, hey, are you using that trailer? Do you mind if I borrow it? I'm moving into a new apartment and it would be great to save some money on a moving truck. If so, don't worry. This doesn't really apply to you at all. Trailer interchange insurance coverage is more for the working man. It's really not too complicated. The coverage is recommended and can even be required when you do not own the trailer you are hauling. As the driver, you are then protected in case the trailer happens to get damaged during transport. In the trucking world, this happens most often with power-only trucking. Now, power-only trucking is when companies that produce goods don't really know all the ins and outs of trucking but they still need to transport their goods. In most of these cases, they own trailers and then hire drivers or power only carriers to haul their products. Got it? Great. If you have questions about the trailer interchange coverage or other coverages, you can fill out the form below or give CNS Insurance a call at 1-800-724-5523 and one of our commercial insurance specialists will help you out. All right, now hold on. I'm gonna take you back, way back. You remember that time I said it can even be required? The coverage is recommended and can even be required when you do not own the trailer you are hauling. Well, there is a thing called trailer interchange agreement. Okay, well basically, this is a contract that organizes the transfer of goods between two transporting parties to make sure it arrives where it is supposed to. And within these agreements, there's usually a clause that says, hey, you gotta get trailer interchange coverage. As a carrier, this coverage is pretty important because your regular insurance is not going to cover anything that you do not own. So when you hook up and haul someone else's trailer and goods, nothing behind the power unit is covered. That's why the interchange agreement often requires the extra coverage. Also to qualify for this coverage, the trailer needs to be in the insured's possession. So what does it actually cover? 
Well, it'll cover things like theft, vandalism, accidental damage, floods and fires, loading freight, and unloading freight. But now onto the important part, cost. Of course, you will have a choice of limit and deductible, but ultimately the minimum limit for trailer interchange coverage should be at least enough to repair or replace a damaged trailer. If you don't get enough to cover it, you would end up being liable for any extra damage. If you have questions about your coverages or would like to shop your insurance, you can fill out the form below or give CNS Insurance a call at 1-800-724-5523 and one of our commercial insurance specialists will help you out. You remember the good old days when you were a young buck, single, and didn't have anything to worry about? You could just work odd jobs and get by. You weren't thinking about health insurance, much less getting extra insurance coverage for your cargo. You could go on a date and, hey, maybe you gave them your real cell phone number. Or maybe you bought a pay-as-you-go phone as extra insurance just in case they said some questionable things and you need another date to see if they're really crazy. Wait, you don't remember that? Okay, well, disregard everything I said then, but that is basically what short-term load coverage is when you have a high-value item that needs more insurance coverage. There are a couple different types of short-term load coverage, spike and gap cargo coverage and pay-per-load cargo coverage. These two coverages are different, and we will be focusing on pay-per-load coverage right now, but just so you know, while spike and gap cargo coverage does cover high-value loads, it only increases the value of the coverage that you currently have, but it doesn't change anything about the coverage terms. Paper load cargo coverage, on the other hand, allows you to increase the value of coverage as well as expand the coverage further, like for theft or losing a load to a natural disaster. Basically, that is where spike and gap cargo coverage falls short. As a quick example, let's say a shipper requires $750,000 in cargo coverage in order to approve your transport of their shipment. Basically, you would call us and state that you need $750,000 in coverage for one load. We would get you a quote and then add that to your policy as a short-term coverage for that one load. And that's it. That's paper load insurance coverage. You get $750,000 in cargo coverage that replaces your current cargo limit. This can work to your benefit in many ways, including going after lucrative spot market opportunities and ensuring your customers are properly taken care of in the event of an accident on these single, more valuable loads. If you have questions or need an insurance quote, you can contact us at info at cnsinsures.com or you can just fill out the form in the description below. Okay, if you've been thinking about getting your CDL or we're in the middle of training, you've probably heard of this already, but the FMCSA has implemented a lot of changes to the CDL testing requirements that they are calling modernized CDL testing. Pennsylvania is one of the many states that adopted these changes, which became official on August 28, 2023. To sum it up, the pre-trip vehicle inspection test has gotten much easier as there will be fewer items to go over and you can even use a checklist. On the other hand, the behind the wheel portion has gotten a bit more difficult as there will be four parking maneuvers compared to three previously and trainees will have a much smaller footprint to make these maneuvers. Our podcast, Caution Wide Right, has already released a detailed discussion on this topic, which you can check out in the link above. You can also go to cnstrains.com and visit the modernized CDL testing page. On that page, you will find a detailed article and videos discussing all of the changes and showing exactly how the pre-trip inspection and maneuvers need to be done. If you're interested in getting your CDL or if you just have questions, get in touch by filling out the form below or emailing us at support at cnstrains.com or call us at 717-496-9145 and one of our CDL instructors can help you out. Have you ever done any kind of sanding and said to yourself, eh, I don't need to wear a mask. I'm only gonna be doing this for a short time. Well, you might be right. It may not cause any long-term damage if you're only doing it for a short time or only doing it once but it can still affect your lungs. You might realize the next day that you are coughing or having a hard time breathing. Now, imagine working in that type of environment every day for your entire shift. Yeah, that can do some serious damage. That's a lot of damage. That's why the US Department of Labor has recently released a proposed rulemaking that they hope will reduce silica dust exposure and do a better job of protecting the health of workers in the mining industry. 
As a reminder, if you have questions, you can just email us at info at cnsocmed.com or just fill out the form below and a CNS Occupational Healthcare Specialist will help you out. These changes are coming as a result of a recent study from researchers at the University of Illinois Chicago. This study found a clear link between silica exposure and severe black lung disease in contemporary U.S. coal miners. They found that silica exposure is a driving force behind rising rates of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. Basically, this rule change would ensure miners have at least the same level of protection as workers in other industries. There are several changes that would be coming if and when the rule is official. One, the permissible exposure limit, or PEL, drops to 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air, and that goes down from 100. Two, if the PEL is exceeded, mine operators need to take immediate corrective actions. Three, if a miner's exposure exceeds the PEL, exposure sampling, periodic sampling, and corrective actions are required. Four, medical surveillance will be provided to miners at no cost. And five, Operators need to replace existing respiratory protection standard requirements. According to Chris Williamson, the Assistant Secretary for Mine Safety and Health, the purpose of this proposed rule is simple. Prevent more miners from suffering from debilitating and deadly occupational illnesses by reducing their exposure to silica dust. Miners should never be forced to choose between preserving their health and providing for themselves and their families. <coughs> I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. It's not very well ventilated down there. With this rule, it is expected that the risk of death from silica exposure will decrease by 9.5%. If you have questions or think that your company needs to increase protection for workers from silica exposure, you can contact us by filling out the form below, emailing us at info at cnsocmed.com, or calling us at 1-800-551-9816 and an occupational healthcare specialist will help you out. Merman! Well, that's all I have for you this month. Hopefully this information has been helpful. If you ever have questions, give us a shout and we'll be happy to help you out. We'll see you next month. Once September ends. Green Day, baby. Summer has come and passed. The innocent can never last Wake me up when September ends